Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-hosts, Shannon Lane, Newmark, Caleb Hoppus, Hanlon, David Birdwell, Topstack, and Peter Snelling. Uh, Shannon, can you give us a rundown of who we have on the air with us today, please? Sure, Herb. We have a great lineup today. We'll be starting off with Sean Kirshner, Executive Director of Achieve Now. Then we'll have David Stonecipher, Managing Partner of Herbine, followed by Ed Sattel, Founder and Chairman of the Sattel Institute. And we'll be wrapping up today with Mitchell Kaplan, Managing Shareholder of Zarwin Bong. Let's get to know our first guest, Sean Kirshner, Executive Director of Achieve Now. Sean, what is Achieve Now? What are you guys doing? Achieve Now is a nonprofit in Philadelphia, and we work with K-2 students to uh, build their reading skills to make them proficient and confident readers. How many kids do you work with a year? We usually work with about 800, uh, up to about 1,000 every year. Wow. Um, where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? I'm from Northern California, and I'm an only child. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell me a little bit about the uh, environment you grew up in when you were 8 to 14. Was it a well-to-do environment or what was going on? Uh, it was not a well-to-do environment. And, and when I was that age, uh, my mom was going back to school and she was a single parent. And so uh, we were living in like student housing and barely getting by. Hmm. What kind of stuff were you doing 8 to 14 years old? What was the list of kind of stuff you were doing as a kid? <laughs> Uh, well, the first, first and foremost, I was baseball obsessed. I loved baseball and I was playing it all the time. Um, I was also involved in student government um, and um, I was also a theater kid, did, mm -hmm. did some acting. Didn't you mention, uh, let's see, you mentioned earlier in the green room that um, you were raised by a single mom and that you felt as a kid you could change your stars. What are you talking about that you thought you could change your stars? Well, as someone who, as someone who, you know, grew up uh, without a lot of resources, um, I felt like uh, I, I still was, I still was given um, a vision for an alternative life, an, another way of, of living one's life. And I think part of that was because well, while I was growing up, my mom was in school and uh, there was a, a sense of education is a, is a kind of portal to be able to change your narrative. What's that have to do with your role as executive director of Achieve Now? It's everything. I was lucky when I was growing up because there was a door that I could see. And I think a lot of people don't see that door. And so I really believe that at Achieve Now, one of the things we can do is show people that that door exists. Thank you, Mr. Birdwell. Tom, what do you think your mom uh, impact uh, she had on you growing up? Can you talk to you more about that impact? Absolutely. I think everything. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I was watching her work two or three jobs all the time, go to school, stay up late, you know, trying to get her work done, et cetera. And I sort of understood that um, changing your stars requires a lot of hard work and dedication, you know, single minded vision. And so I learned that from her. Mm -hmm. So that theme of establishing grit, what from that do you take to work with you every day? In this job, I wear many, many hats and there's all kinds of things happening. And so there's a kind of flexibility, but also just kind of a dogged determination that keeps things running. Peter. Yeah, uh, Sean, how young were you when the desire to lead became clear to you that you were the leader? Very early. I, I was a class president in fifth grade. And um, ever since then, I've always been elected to leadership positions or assumed leadership positions for almost every activity I've been part of. And how does that inform sort of lucky breaks you talked about yourself? When I talked about lucky breaks, I was really talking about um, the fact that, uh, that my mom was in school and I did have um, the, the, the sort of vision of education and the way it could change one's life. I think a lot of people don't have that. And I really do feel like that was the break that, um, that you know, provided uh, everything that's come since then. Mm -hmm. Shannon? And outside of your family, who was someone you looked up to as a kid? Mostly my teachers. I really, really loved uh, that relationship between teacher and student, um, both because it extended my community, but also really I just the, that environment, that learning environment, I've always thought, found to just be really exciting. And it, you mentioned extended your community. Tell us more about that. What does community mean to you? Well, as someone who comes from a very, very small family of two, um, I think that, uh, you know, extending that, extending that, 
that, those concentric circles out uh, is, is really important and, and building a, a sort of um, a, a larger family. And so that community uh, is something I've been in search of, of my whole life. And I, 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 it's one of the things that I really, really strive to create uh, in my in the work environment that I'm in charge of, the, the culture that I'm in charge of creating here at Achieve Now. And why is that important at Achieve Now? Um, well, we're in a small and very flexible group. And so I think that, um, and, you know, and, and we're invested in serving um, people who are under-resourced. And so I think that um, seeing them as, as, as a sort of part of a larger community that, that, uh, that we want to be a part of and we want to serve is really important to our mission. Mm -hmm. Caleb? John, what position did you play on the baseball diamond? <laughs> I was a pitcher and I played center field. What was your uh, pitching style? Uh, mostly fastball, uh, a decent, decent curve, not particularly great at changing speeds. <laughs> so power pitchers, they, they get a little wild. What kind of strategy do you have if you get down the count? Uh, my coach always said, when you get down the count, just relax and focus on the catcher's glove. And um, I think that's really you know, valuable advice and something I continue to do when things get a little hairy. Yeah, so how does that mentality to re relate directly to being the executive director at a nonprofit? Uh, again, I'm wearing so many hats. There are so many different inputs um, uh, that I think the, the ability to just say, just to sort of like focus on what's essential in that moment has, has been something that's really been valuable to me. Mm -hmm. Sean, you mentioned um, you grew up in two different communities. On one hand, you know, you grew up in a, when you went to school, you were hanging out with the smart kids, but the neighborhood you grew up in, you were one of the few white kids uh, because you didn't have a lot of money. I'm trying to figure out what did hanging out with the smart kids and growing up as one of the few white kids, what's that have to do with your role at, at uh, Achieve Now as executive director? I think it's everything. I mean, it, those, those are the sort of two sides of, of my life. And I feel like, um, you know, what I want to be able to, to do for folks is give them an opportunity to change their stars as well. And so um, I understand where uh, the students we're serving and the families that, that we're serving are coming from. Um, but I also, I think I have a valuable, um, you know, valuable experience in terms of, you know, what one can do to get out of that situation. So as opposed to this being a job, this seems to be part of your soul. It's you not know, a job. It's a calling. What do you mean? It's a calling. I feel, I feel like in some ways this work is, is, is what goes on my epitaph. I really, I really honestly feel that way. Uh, and so um, I, I feel like, you know, the mark I'll make on this world is one in which uh, I've transformed lives and hopefully transformed family narratives. So um, do you ever walk, do you ever get out of your fancy dancy office just to hang out with some of these kids? Absolutely. All the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you think you've changed any lives? I think we have. Yeah. We've got some really interesting stories of, of students whose, um, whose lives have been transformed by, by what we do, but also really by the relationships that they have with their coaches who coach them. Um, so we provide, I think we provide that opportunity for them. You provide what opportunity for your kids? Um, well, not only do they increase their reading skills, but they have an opportunity to form a really strong bond with a, a volunteer at one of our corporate partner sites, who's typically uh, the people who coach our, our students. And so some of those bonds um, last long after the year that they're together working as, as the tutor and as the student. And so, you know, we, we have, we have, we hear stories all the time about um, kids who check in, you know, with their coaches years later as they're getting ready to go to college or, you know, um, to give them updates on, on the way that, the, that their lives have, have been changed. So it sounds to me like you're helping your kids uh, pick up uh, additional mommies and daddies and buddies and aunts and uncles and friends. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that it's important to remember is that these kids have really uh, fat, beautiful and loving families. And so in some ways what we do is we give them an opportunity to extend their community. Mm -hmm. And this is really part of who you are. This is not, uh, how long have you been doing this job? I took over this position in May of 2016. So a little over five years. You see an end to it? To, to this particular position, perhaps, but I think to uh, dedicating my life to this kind of work, no. Oh, so this really is filling for you, really helping the kids understand that they can change their stars like you had the portal to see that you might be able to, and you did change your own direction. What's, what's the, um, what's the website address for this organization uh, achieve now? 
It's achieve-now.com. Um, let me have that one more time. Achieve dash now.com. And, and let me ask you this. I mean, I guess the benefit of you're being the executive director is you get to go in at 10 or 11, you get to leave at three or four. You don't have to work weekends, right? Nope. No, no. But as I said, I wear many hats. So I'm the IT guy. I'm the chief financial guy. I do everything. So it's a, it's a seven to seven job every day. We've been speaking with Sean Kirshner, Executive Director of Achieve Now here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com. That's executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. Don't go away. You now can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Yes, recognize, you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Simply visit executiveleadersradio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable to your advisors. Yes, this radio and online social media exposure is free and quite valuable to your business advisors who deserve to be recognized. Visit executiveleadersradio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Dave Stonecipher, managing partner of Herbine. Dave, what is Herbine? What are you guys up to? Thanks, Herb. Herbine & Company is a CPA firm and consulting firm based in Reading, Pennsylvania. We've got uh, nine offices stretching from Pittsburgh to Marlton, New Jersey, and about 240 employees. Mm -hmm. How long have you been the managing partner of Herbine, and what size was it when you got involved versus now? I, I've been the managing partner for a little over two years. Uh, since I've become managing partner, we've added about uh, we've added two companies and about uh, thirty five more employees in that time frame. So you're all about growth. Um, where you're from originally? How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? I grew up on a farm on the eastern shore of Maryland, and I'm the oldest of two boys. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, want to give me a hand? Yeah, sure, Dave. Some of our audience may not realize how hard it is, how hard farm life can be. And how did that affect you and how does it influence what you're doing now? So growing up a farm was a wonderful uh, upbringing, but it definitely taught me uh, the, the value of hard work and, and effort. And you know, I watched my father for, for many years, you know, struggle and work hard to provide for the family. And I definitely did learn some lessons from that. And how does that relate to what you're doing now? Well, I mean, what I what I'm doing now is certainly if I if I want to achieve anything, it requires hard work. So it, you know, every day I come to work, you know, put the hat on and then do whatever it takes to get the job done again to provide for my family and to make the life for my family better than uh, than what I had. Uh, give me an example, eight to fourteen, of how you were working hard on this farm. What are you talking about? Yeah, so you know, a typical farm kid, if you get up in the morning, you'd have chores before school, and you'd go to school, and then do that, and then the you know the evenings I'd have baseball practice, and come home, and then a couple more chores before uh, the homework started. So mm -hmm. you know, some long days to get the get things accomplished. And what time did you have to get started in the morning? Did you have to go out there in the cold weather? Yeah, usually around six o'clock. And you, we, I grew up on a livestock farm, so that requires you know feeding sheep, and you know in the summertime that was baling hay and things like that. But it was you know. Animals need to be fed two times a day every day, so there's, there's no uh, there's no stop there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Birdwell, Dave, are you more like mom or dad? A um, little bit of both, honestly, David, but probably a little more like my father. Again, hard work and just whatever it uh, whatever it takes to get the job done. I learned from him, and that's what I continue to do today. What did you see him on the farm, or what did you hear him uh, say to you growing up that you take to work with you every day? I mean, you know, farm life's filled with uh, adversity, whether it's weather or commodity prices or animal health. And, you know, I watched my father struggle through that, but fight through it to uh, to survive. And I, I took that uh, that lesson of, of fight to survive into what I do every day today. You know, it just it, life throws you adversity and you got to fight through it to, to achieve success. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Caleb, why don't you give me a hand here? Dave, when you weren't busy working on the farm or doing homework, what did you do for fun? Uh, definitely was a baseball kid. I loved playing baseball and again, growing up with a younger brother on a farm. We, you know, we played a lot of baseball together in the evenings and that, that was definitely a first love. 
did, did you do anything uh, relating to baseball to make any money? Yeah, so I was a little bit of a always had a little bit of a hustle in me. So I had an opportunity as, as a teenager to uh, to umpire one of my brother's little league games, and that turned into a, a passion. And I became a, a pretty uh, pretty passionate umpire from there on out. Yeah, even in the little league, that can be a tough job with parents, coaches. Uh, what made you want to be an umpire? Well, again, I just it's a love of baseball, and 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 frankly, they needed help that night, so I stepped up to help, and it led to a, a passion, and I just really learned to to love officiating baseball. I wasn't good enough to make it to the major leagues and play baseball, but this was a way I could stay connected with the game I love, and you know, to be a good umpire, frankly, I learned quickly that you need to master the rules of the game. You need to have patience and be decisive and have hustle and self-control when you're getting yelled at by parents and, and coaches, and it, it gave me a lot of life lessons in, in that journey. Yeah, I think all those skills learned early can probably relate to business also. So so how do you relate that to running the CPA firm? Uh, again, every day it takes hustle and it, it this, this role I'm in now absolutely takes decisiveness. It takes a lot of patience and massaging personalities. And, and being a CPA is a very rules-based business and I need to have a mastery of, uh, of accounting rules to, to be successful in what I do today. So every, every bit of what I learned in the umpire journey, I, uh, I, I'm very grateful for because it absolutely mm-hmm. translated into what I do today. Shannon? David, you mentioned that when you were playing baseball, you were a pitcher. I'm curious, what was your role as pitcher and why did you like that position? I, I love being a pitcher, Shannon, because uh, the play starts with a pitcher. So you've kind of got control of each of the, the plays. And I love the chess match of playing the you know, pitcher versus hitter and trying to outwit the hitter, whether it was type of pitch, speed of pitch, location of pitch. So I, I love the chess game and the strategy of being a pitcher. And how does your role as pitcher relate to your role nowadays as managing partner at Herbine? So, you know, in trying to run the CPA firm, I'm constantly strategizing about how to beat our competition, make the firm better, and to position our firm for growth and to, uh, to go into the next generation through, you know, acquisitions and different uh, industries and service offerings that, that we're looking to do. So it's, it's constantly a it, – this position is very much a strategy position, and that, that no doubt came from my love of pitching and the strategy there. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that when you were a kid, you got involved playing the organ at church and you were about 15. So was church part of your life as a kid? It was growing up in a farm community. It was every Sunday, put on your Sunday best and go to church. And the, the, you know, I took piano lessons as a kid and the, the organ situation happened because the, uh, the little old lady that played the organ every Sunday passed away and somebody needed to step up. And I, took the opportunity to step up and play the organ for a couple, a couple years in my teen years. Did they ask you to do it or did you uh, offer to do it? A uh, it, little bit of nobody was there to do it. So I guess in hindsight probably did offer, but there was, there was no other option, I guess, at the end of the day. So I would say I stepped up there. Were there any other 15 year old kids in the history of the church <laughs> that had, that had uh, played the organ? Not, not to my recollection no. Uh huh. So, how did everybody respond? How did the congregation respond to a fifteen-year-old kid playing the organ? Oh. Well, I, I I was moderately okay at the organ, so I I think they were just happy to have somebody to play the organ. But again, it's just it's it's giving back to community. I guess you think about it. Somebody had to do it, and the the church was in need, and that's that's where I stepped up and then filled that role. So. What do you mean giving back to community? What are you talking about? You're only fifteen. Well, I mean that that's. You know, I kind of learned from my parents. It's an important thing. If you have blessings, you want to give back to your community where you can give back and, and provide service or, or resources that you ought to take that opportunity. It's we're in this everything together and where you can give back to community. That's an important, important thing to do. Uh-huh. Where you can give back to community. It's an important thing to do. So you, you are of community. What, what does that have to do with building this accounting firm and looking at other opportunities for the accounting firm and trying to help find opportunities for your clients? What do you, what's that all about? Well, one of the things I'm very proudest about this firm is we were very successful and very blessed here at Herbine. And we take those blessings and give back to our community. We're always looking to uh, provide opportunities for the communities that we work in and thrive in. And you know, our goal here at the firm is to help our clients, you know, achieve their successes uh, by providing solutions. And, you know, when, when all that's working, everybody's prosperous and that prosperity, you know, you, you feel that inherent need to give back. Do you ever stop? No, I just wanted to I, that's sure. not, I don't, under, I don't, I don't know how to do that to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, that's not in my DNA. Mm-hmm. co host who's got up the next question. Yeah, Dave, so uh, running an accounting firm requires setting and meeting priorities. What did you learn from growing up on a farm that helped you know what to do first, next? 
Well, there's just there's always something to do. You're never done, and you just have to learn what how to prioritize, frankly, and and prioritize what's important and, and accomplish those goals. Because again, is there's never there's never an end. There's never a finish. It's just getting it's getting the next task done and the most important task done to achieve the goal. So you can't waste time. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Hmm. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ha- yes, Caleb. So you're willing to jump into unknown roles, you know, the Oregon playing, the umpiring, those seem like leadership traits to me. So, so how does that relate to how you interact with your employees at the CPA firm? Well, I mean, I, I, I have a mantra around here at the firm and I, I have the tagline of, I want people to raise their hand and, and meaning like, look for an opportunity and where you see a spot where you can be better and help the firm be better. I want people to step up. So I, I that's, that's kind of a tagline I use is raise your hand. And I, I think I've led by example by doing that throughout my life. And, you know, where you see opportunities, step up and, and be part of it and be part of the solution. Mm-hmm. Caleb or Mr. Bird, uh, Shannon or Mr. Birdwell. David, where do you see community play a role in what you guys are doing at Herbine nowadays? Well, again, they're, they're, everybody has a passion project, it seems like, and our firm absolutely is there to support our team members, uh, whether it's what, what, whatever they're interested in their own communities, we're here to support them with time and resources to allow them to to give back in the community wherever they wish. So there's constantly events going on here at the firm where team members are participating with the United Way or other charities, and, and we're, we're absolutely supportive of that. And what's the uh, website address for this organization known as Herbine? Herbine.com, H-E-R-B-E-I-N. H-E-R-B-E-I-N.com. We've been speaking with Dave Stonecipher, managing partner of Herbine here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com. That's executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders. Back in a moment, right after this quick break. Don't go away. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, and we'd like to introduce Ed Sattel, founder and chairman of the Sattel Institute. Ed, what is the Sattel Institute? What are you guys up to? The Sattel Institute is a think tank for corporate social responsibility. It's a CEO organization that uh, gets CEOs to go ahead and to be thinking more about corporate social responsibility to make the community better for themselves, for the community and for those who live there. Um, where you're from originally, how many brothers and sisters, and where are you in the pecking order? I was from Springfield, Massachusetts, the home of basketball. Mm-hmm. And I have two brothers, and I was the middle guy. All righty. Eight to 14 years, eight to 14 years old. What kind of stuff were you doing? What's the list look like? Well, it was a busy time. I was uh, delivered papers. I worked in various capacities and uh, went to school, was was, uh, very involved with my friends, very involved with sports, very involved with almost anything that came along. Mm -hmm. All righty. Mr. Snelling. Yes, um, Ed, you mentioned in the green room growing up with a lot of people displaced by World War II. What impact did growing up with those people have on your future? Well, I don't know that it had an impact on my future, but it had an impact on reality. Right. Uh, I was born in the shadows of World War II, but I was here in the United States. We didn't have bombs come here or what have you. These are people that grew up in Europe, and they went through all the problems of that, and they were my age. And here they were, uh, having moved from Europe here as a displaced person, meaning they didn't really have a home. And how did that change you? to one of appreciation, to one to understand that, uh, that we were lucky. I was lucky to be born in the USA, that the USA it was not only lucky, but the USA was willing to help. Uh, we were not just people that had gone ahead and had success, but we used our success to help others. And has that changed the way you see social responsibility or corporate responsibility? Well, sure, sure. I think corporate social, uh, social responsibility is an important thing. Uh, we all want to have a better city. We all want to have a better community. We all want it better for our children. Well, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. What Mr. do you Birdwell? mean by that? Well, yeah. let's see. Um, Ed, earlier you mentioned that the community that you grew up in um, 60, 70, 80 years ago, that you still have friends till this day. 
What's that tell us about you in relationships and people? Well, I think it tells more about my friends than it does about me. Uh, we grew up, we we're a pretty good gang of, of guys, uh, disparate. I was one of the little guys. I grew up later than they did. And uh, they were all smarter than me. Uh, two went to Yale, two went to Harvard, four went to Cornell, five went to Wesleyan, one went to Bates. And, but I always kid them that I was the only one who got accepted to the University of Connecticut. <laughs> So you have long-term relationships. You have the social responsibility. You remember the impact of displaced kids, of persons, displaced persons when you were a kid. Isn't that what the Sattel Institute's all about? Well, you know, also as a kid, there were older people in the community that built things for us. I benefited from the basketball courts and from the nice community I grew up in. Uh, I had a history of uh, in business after I did okay in business, I uh, would give a lot to nonprofits. And I was very active in that community. And many presidents would come to me and ask, could we do the same thing? Could you help us? Well, you can't help them in a day. You can't help them in an hour. You could tell them about the things that you're doing. But there came a time I thought I was going to retire. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, I thought I'd answer the call. Uh, to help others. And we set up something called the Sattel Institute, which is a think tank for corporate social responsibility. It was a CEO organization mm -hmm. and uh, it was one with teeth. It was actionable. And to be a member, uh, you, you had to contribute a minimum of $100,000 over four years, 25000 a year for four years, 100% of the money going to a nonprofit. I was always a very big believer in nonprofits. They took on the jobs that businesses and government didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you have an alcoholic working for you, it's tough to handle that. And so you need to go <laughs> to a nonprofit or somebody to help. Or if you have, your kid has a childhood disease, where do you go? You can't do that in the office. And so nonprofits represent the soul in many ways of the community. They take on the problems. And I think the most important nonprofit of them all is the one your family needs. If your family has a problem, somebody's got cancer, then you, you want to use them. If you got a heart, you want to use them. If it's uh, recreation or child development or whatever the case might be. And uh, I felt obligated that we should help them. Mm -hmm. And I rallied the CEO, the important CEOs in the greater Philadelphia area of the region and now central Pennsylvania mm -hmm. uh, to participate. And you, you couldn't be a talker in our group. You have to be a doer. So you had to make a contribution. Mm -hmm. And they love getting together with each other and learning about how to do it better. Shannon? Ed, in the green room, you mentioned to whom much is given, much is expected. What were you talking about? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, if, we, if we're lucky enough to be born in the USA and we're lucky enough to go ahead and have a success in life, we ought to give something back. I mentioned before, we all stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. In other words, we all inherited what came before us. And now it's our turn to go ahead and give back. And most generations leave the world a better place than they found it. It's a little challenging right now. And so we need, and certainly businesses need to go ahead and work a little harder at this to leave this world a little better place than we found it. Mm -hmm. Caleb? Hey, Mr. Sattel, how young were you when you started working and what time of, types of jobs did you hold? Well, I started working when I had a bicycle and I, I would deliver newspapers and I liked work. It was fun to work. It was rewarding to work. Uh, it was sort of getting a job done and that felt good. So with your approach to these uh, these jobs that you were working, what made you different from the other kids your age? Well, most of my friends went to graduate school and they went to law school and medical school and that sort of thing and became pretty good at what they did. Uh, I went into business and I learned an awful lot from business. Business is problem solving. And if you're active in business and you're active in problem solving, it can take you to many wonderful worlds. Uh, but you always got to contribute and leave things a little better and make a contribution to uh, to uh, help them become better. I like that. And I like the world we're in. What did you do on your bike route or maybe one of the other jobs that you held? What kind of problem solving did you do back then? 
Well, I, I always thought when I wherever I worked, I thought I owned the store. Uh, I acted as if I owned it. Uh, whether it was Mrs. Frookman's delicatessen or it was a supermarket or it was the newspaper route and I had to deliver papers to wherever it was. That's the way I acted. I thought it was mine. And, uh, and, and I got the rewards for doing that. It, it felt good. What, what felt good? Caring. But you didn't own it. Excuse me? You didn't own Mrs. Fructor's delicatessen, but you felt like you, you know, did. You, you, you know, you are what your mind believes. Uh, I believe that uh, I, I knew I didn't own it, but I knew that I should do the best job I possibly could to make it better. And so I worked like an owner. I thought like an owner. I thought like uh, that, that way. And it was uh, I benefit from that. It's much better to love a job than to hate a job. Give me that again. It's much better to love a job than to hate a job. It's much better to go ahead and be inspired by your job and want to do a good and leave it, 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 do a good job than it is to go ahead and do a lousy job and try to get away with things. There's no passion in that. There's no inspiration in that. Mm. Mm -hmm. The last business you sold, how many employees were there? 700. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Well, what's the uh, what's the website address of the Satel Institute? It's satelinstitute.org. And how do you spell that? S-A-T-E-L-L Institute. And then dot org. We've been speaking with Ed Sattel, who is the founder and chairman and quite a successful entrepreneur. Ed Sattel is the founder and chairman of the Sattel Institute here on Executive Leaders Radio. We encourage you to visit his website, the uh, SattelInstitute.org. And don't forget to visit our website. It's ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. That's ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. And uh, Ed, do you think you're ever going to stop? I don't think so. I didn't think uh, so It's either. fun. Mm -hmm. I endowed uh, the Sedell Institute with, ten, with uh, $15 million. Wow. So that we would have to charge no dues. Excellent. So no members pay dues. And when they make those contributions, 100% goes to the non Sattelinstitute.org. We'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. Recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Yes, recognize, you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Simply visit executiveleadersradio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Radio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. Yes, this radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. To your business advisors who deserve to be recognized, visit executiveleadersradio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors for free exposure. Back, you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Mitchell Kaplan, Managing Shareholder, Zarwin Baum. Mitchell, what is Zarwin Baum? What are you guys up to? <laughs> Zarwin Baum is a uh, mid-sized commercial law firm headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but with all offices all over Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And uh, where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I'm a Philly boy out of a row home. I have uh, two brothers um, mm -hmm. and spent my uh, entire life in the Philadelphia area. And you grew up in a row house. And uh, what was going on with you 8 to 14? What kind of stuff was going on 8 to 14? So uh, 8 to 14 at the, at the age of about 11, uh, I went from, you know, this lifestyle life that I had as a young boy and uh, it's growing up in a neighborhood in Mount Airy outside, of, I mean, in Philadelphia. And then all of a sudden I had to go to the suburbs of Philadelphia and start a new life with new friends in an area that I was unfamiliar. 
So how did you go about getting accepted and making friends in this new neighborhood in fifth grade, the beginning of fifth grade? Well, being a bit of a, a social animal, um, I somehow realized that uh, my humor was a way to get acceptance. So uh, rather than becoming the class clown, I think I became more of the class comic, uh, yeah. irritating my teachers to no end. Um, on the other hand, you also grew up, uh, you know, in a community where, you know, you were in the same economic status originally in these row houses. When you moved to this new neighborhood, didn't you mention that you weren't necessarily <clears throat> the richest kid on the block anymore? What yeah, well, we, we went from, you know, as I said, I went to from a row home uh, to uh, a rather affluent neighborhood. My parents wanted to make sure I had the best education. So I lived in an apartment and I was uh, one of the poor kids in uh, with the people I grew up with. Uh huh. What, what do you think that did to you growing up uh, one of the poorest kids when you eventually moved? Well, I, I had to realize that uh, I was different mm -hmm. um, because I really needed to support myself at a very young age and really became more of an, a, a, like an adult at, at age 15 and 16 when I got my first job while I was going to high school selling shoes at Tom McCann's. Peter? I became, I, I became the yeah. best shoe salesman they had there. And That's I was, I was just thinking, thinking about that. You had jobs where you were, you know, they were tough jobs and yet you became a, a lawyer and a leader. What inspired you from your early work to go where you are now? Well, I, as I said, in high school, I, I spent three years uh, selling shoes at Tom McCann's. And then when I was at a local college, I had to work at Temple University. I also had to work to support myself. And, uh, and I became a clothing salesman at, at Bloomingdale's. So I, I was always a people person. I always realized that, that the customer or the client come first and they're always right. That's what you learn when you go through major sales operations like Tom McCann's and Bloomingdale's. How does that help that you build just this law? Gave me the background and the talent to be a people person for what I do now. Mm -hmm. Shannon? So earlier you mentioned that you married your high school sweetheart. What does that tell us about you? <laughs> uh, that tells me I'm a very committed person. I guess if you take the positive, I'm a very committed person. Uh, like uh, I, I'm married uh, 43 years um, with the same law firm for 40 years. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of longevity there, a lot of commitment, a lot of commitment. And you mentioned over those 40 years, when you first started, there were six attorneys and now there's over 60. Tell us about that. Well, um, I, uh, when I joined the firm, like I said, I was one of uh, six, seven attorneys at the time. And, and as I learned um, the practice of law, um, I also learned that I wanted to be responsible for the growth of our law firm. So like I had been in, in my prior positions, I always wanted to achieve at the highest levels. And I was going to me and surround myself with the right people that were going to grow this firm uh, much greater and uh, really try to achieve some big things. And uh, I, I think we've achieved a lot of those things and we're far from being over. And Mitchell, how does this um, responsibility and commitment um, help your clients nowadays? Well, um, you know, as I said, I, I always accepted responsibility as, as a young child. Um, and uh, I've done that in my position now. And again, surround myself with people uh, of similar uh, philosophies that are involved in hard work, uh, that they care about the community, that they respect the people that they work with. And, uh, and that's what I've tried to achieve here. Caleb? Mitchell, you lived in both a city and suburban setting as a child. How did your friends group differ? Uh, they differed a lot. Uh, I mean, um, but I, I don't know if the difference is a uh, from a, a territorial geographic thing or just more of an economic thing. Um, you know, the suburbs 
around Philadelphia or Jen tend to be more affluent than the inner city. And then and people when you are made different. The, people are different. Right. When you made the jump, uh, when you made the move, how did you make new friends in your new setting? Um, well, I, as I said, I, I, I did it through uh, comic relief uh, in the classroom. But uh, I, I also was uh, outgoing and was able to make friends. But I think what I ended up doing was probably making friends with the lower element rather than the higher element, if you catch my drift. Yeah, and you also mentioned that you were a little bit different when you were younger. So I'm wondering how that personality trait back then uh, differentiates how, how you position the law firm now. Well, um, I consider myself a special person. I consider the people that work here to be special. And I consider our law firm to be special. So hope that answers that question. You mentioned, uh, you know, Zorwin Baum has a reputation of being very community oriented, you know, with the uh, number of events you've run uh, to help raise money and engage the community. Where, where's that coming from? Why do you bother doing that stuff? Well, well uh, as I told you, I joined a law firm, uh, Zorwin Baum that were uh, started back in 1960 by Norman Zarwin and, and Harris Baum. And uh, so when I joined the firm, there was already, when, I, when we talked about that six or seven person law firm, they were charitable back then because Norman and Harris were charitable, charitable people and always gave back to the community. So as, as the group of us started joining the law firm, we followed through with that same philosophy and really try to enhance it and take it several levels above what it was before. Mm -hmm. we, um, we consider that a core value of our firm. And we do that, as, as you said, we have a number of events uh, that we run for charitable causes, mm -hmm. um, but we also do it in our office as well and try to get our employees all involved. So we have uh, what we call our denim days, and if people wear denim on a Friday, they've got to contribute uh, to a uh, to a charity. Mm -hmm. And we allow our employees mm -hmm. to pick the charities that we use on these on these uh, denim. Days. And if you go back to uh, growing up in that apartment building, how, how young were you when you started making money? What were you doing? I was 15. Yeah. And what were you do? How were you make? How would you do to make money? Was that the shoes? Yeah, that's when I was selling, uh -huh. shoes. selling yeah. shoes at 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about that? Whose that's idea was that? Was that your idea? Yeah, I was looking for a job, and that was the job that I was able to get. And what you did different than the other kids is you figured out how to sell shoes with your personality. Correct. So everything you've done, you've brought your personality to it, including the building the law firm. I guess that's one of the reasons you've been able to attract and retain some really good people and also attract and retain some clients that really appreciate you. It's just like selling shoes. It's being good to people and appreciating who they are. And, and knowing that the client's always right. And the knowing that the client is always right. Well, what's the website address for your organization? Uh, Zarwin.com, Z-A-R-W-I-N.com. Let me have that one more time. Zarwin.com, Z-A-R-W-I-N.com. We've been speaking with Mitchell Kaplan, managing shareholder, Zarwin Baum, here on Executive Leaders Radio. And uh, Shannon, can you give us a rundown on who else we've had on the air today, please? Sure, Herb. We had a great show today. We started off with Sean Kirshner, Executive Director of Achieve Now. Then we had David Stonecipher, managing partner of Herbine, followed by Ed Sattel, founder and chairman of the Sattel Institute. And just now we wrapped up with Mitchell Kaplan, managing shareholder of Zarwin Baum. I'd like to thank my co-hosts, including Shannon Lane Newmark, Caleb Hoppus Hanlon, Dave Birdwell Topstack, and an old friend Peter Snelling giving me a hand, structuring the questions, hoping for providing our listening audience an educational and entertaining show. I'd like to thank our listening audience for listening. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a radio show. Don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com. That's executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders. Thank you for joining us today and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.